I tell you what I thought of this weekend? What? I was thinking about our theme song. And, or not even just theme song, but like little things that we can have, right? And you know how, like, you read things a certain way? Well, I feel like we need some way to create that Spongebob sound, but Serial Sisters. You know when they, like, put emphasis on something in Spongebob and it's like... Yeah, it's like, Serial Sisters! <laughs> That should be able to be taggable in moments. True. You're not wrong. Do you want to say what we're talking about today? Because we're... I'm upset. Oh, are we now? Yes. Well, I can't be that upset because no one died, so I, yeah. I can sleep a little bit easier. Yeah. But I, it I'm could, still upset it, about a lot of things. Yeah, you can be upset, but it, it could be way worse. So we're uh, discussing the Tesco Bomber. It's a documentary that's on Netflix if you want to watch it. It's actually, uh, it has a different name on Netflix. Did you write down the name? It's oh, like I super, did. it's like Supermarket Heist or something. I think but that, that was exactly it. Supermarket heist. Okay, well, when or you put in place heist. Okay, when you put in the Tesco bomber on Netflix, it comes up anyway. It opened up, and I saw genres, and it said British documentary true crime, and I was like, I'm in. Uh, I'm in. I mean, yeah, you already know it's gonna be better. As soon as it started, I was like, we're British. I'm here for it. I don't. I feel like everything one sounds more like Nancy Drew to me. I guess when it's like. British because I just like it's like eerie. Why? Why? Why Nancy Drew? You know that she was American, right? Yeah, but like I feel like the outfits and the the, the accent, outfits. the aesthetic. This Do is you like, just mean the nineteen twenties? You know how like you made an I and me like fake character in my little fake Avatar life. I dress like Nancy <laughs> Drew. I'm British and I'm like a PI. Your so. wee character. <laughs> <laughs> You're me. <laughs> Like, put me in the mood for true crime. I was here for it within okay. 10 seconds of this documentary starting. All right. We're starting in the town of somewhere I can't pronounce because she's already told me I said it wrong. I You told me I said it wrong. Well, I don't know Blur who's mouth. right. Blurmouth. It's spelled Blurmouth. If you slur the end and add a British accent, then, like, you'll be fine and no one will know the difference. Um, somewhere in South England. We're going to go with that. On the south coast of England. It was a bougie place. Yeah, wealthy town. Uh, in the year 2000, a Tesco received a call from a news agent telling them that they received a threat through, they call it a photocopier, I'm pretty sure they just mean a fax machine. Yeah, or, I was or, listening to a bunch yeah. of things that they said different. Just like oh yeah, things. they're just way bougier over there and I'm going to make fun of them because I'm trailer trash. So, I like it though. Sometimes I call my vacuum a Hoover just so like I feel bougier about my day. Whenever I think of Ho uh, Hoover, I just think of like the Clue movie with Tim Curry because I love him. But he's like... Why is Edgar Hoover calling your phone? That's what I think of every time. Anyway, they get a threat through their fax machine, and this threat is demanding a thousand pounds put on fifty thousand gift cards or pub. They call them club cards. It's basically an ATM card. It's like a Visa card for them. Yeah, they call it a club card. He's demanding fifty thousand club cards be sent out in the newspaper, and each one of them be able to access an ATM for a thousand dollars. So that he could, you know, like they wouldn't be able to track which ones he got to get the money out. Um, first off, the first thing that's like just kind of weird about the letter that gets sent is that it's signed as a woman. They were trying to figure out kind of a profile for this person and every letter was only signed Sally. Mm -hmm. um, and no last name, nothing really fancy about the signature. Like there was really no personality stamp on any of the threat letters that Tesco was getting so far. Yeah, he asked that they would be sent out on a particular day that he said and that they're all set up with a particular pin that only he would know so that way no one else could get the money. This particular pin, you ask? 3333, three, 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 in which I say, you're a fucking dumbass. You think if I don't find a random ass credit or de like debit card that I'm not going straight to a fucking ATM and you're not trying one 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 two 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 Like, that's what... You couldn't pick I any other... I have done this. Like, I'm not saying I would. But out of every string of numbers, you're going to do one that's so easily guessable. Like, you couldn't do one, two, three, five, six, something, you know, could be a little more out there. Like, you're making, you're a bomber, dude. He's busy making bombs. Exactly. You can't take two minutes, two minutes, maybe two seconds even, to come up with a better string of numbers here. I mean, what's your damn birthday, dude? Like, first year. Come on. This is why you'd be a better criminal. I feel like you've listened to 500 hours of murder mysteries by now. There's, you know, you've learned. Just a lot. lot. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So now we're trying to figure out why Tesco is being the target here. And they're telling us about how they have these complaints. A lot of complaints. Did you pick up on this? A little like bit. Like how many complaints this well, guy's low-key saying they get and that they have all these grudges from past employees. Mm -hmm. Basically that everyone leaves and burns a bridge and no one's friends. Essentially they're Walmart of the UK. That's what <laughs> I was getting. Is that nobody really wants to be there. Everyone just goes there because they have everything. But 
And he's, like, beating around the bush and telling them, like, yeah, we have a lot of enemies, so we're not really sure how to profile this because, you know, so many people hate us. He's mm-hmm. saying that in so many words. If you're over here, then you got to think of it like Walmart to where you would have this huge group of unemployed people that could potentially get together in order to do one of these things. Like, you don't know if you're dealing with this one person or if it is a whole, like, mafia coming after you. The Wow, we went from one person to mafia, like, right out the gate. I mean, yeah. So then after a really lovely beach shot, if you caught that, <laughs> um, it's August 30th. And the detectives got their first potential breakthrough. Tesco received a second threatening letter, and it was fire damage. But it was identical to the first letter. So after they get this fire letter, they feel like they have a good base of forensics. Well, it it started off with first, like, why did they try to destroy it? Or were they just trying to damage it, you know? Because at first, this is what my brain went to which apparently no one else caught on to, but my brain was like, oh, they're, like, scoring the edges to be like, see, bitch, I'm serious. Like, it's really you. Oh, like, they like, <laughs> you know what? I want them to know I mean business. Give exactly. me the lighter. It's like when you burn your ex's picture and you send it to them, like, their face isn't in it anymore. It's like, that's how I feel. Read the message. Did you get that? <laughs> right. That's what I felt like it was like. But, uh, so they ended up being able to pinpoint where the letter came from because a... They call it a post box, but I'm going to say mailbox. Uh, had been set on fire recently, so they were able to track it to be in that mailbox. Yeah, and then I just have, what's up with this fire mail thing? I don't, f- fire and mail, like that's like all of this guy's. Well, it seems like maybe he just, th- he put it in there and then like had a second guess and just was like, I don't want to do it anymore and tried to burn it. And then was, was it like, not just a- kidding, sending but- anyway. Well, here's the thing. I don't understand. Did he put it out himself? Is that why he didn't get fully scored? Did he just start a small fire and run and then he thought it would have been destroyed and did it? And then he's like, oh shit, well, they got the second one. I gotta keep going with this. Like, uh, like I've committed what? now. Yeah, like, like we're two letters Wait. deep. <laughs> this can't be a fluke now. <laughs> They're gonna have questions. Yeah. I've gotta, yeah. I've got I bird can't... marks. I, got, I gotta make up a story now, you know? I can't just say I just ran away and didn't do my job right. I gotta make it up. Like... I don't even know what we're on the actual <laughs> facts of this case anymore. <laughs> All right, are we at the third letter? I think we're at the third letter. Yeah. Good dog. Uh, yeah. And scene. Ready? <laughs> you can't say in scene and try and make me like that. Serious in one. Thank you, one. You know how to not make Thank me serious? You, one. <laughs> well, I didn't want to take five. <laughs> I didn't feel like we needed that long. This is, like, good for my mental health. Right? (laughs) All right. So now the cops get a third letter, but this letter starts to up the stakes a little bit because this letter says that he has small bombs that were ready, and they're, like, ready to be sent to customers and homes of Tesco. What? That's all I have in my notes. That's (laughs) it. It's just, like... I'm pretty sure that was just audio pee. uh, I just channeled Patrick from True Crime Obsessed as... "Ah!" That's me. That would be me if someone said that someone's sending out bombs in the mail. I'd be like, I'm never going outside. Like, my mailbox not even safe? I'm, but, I'm never, and what if I had an apartment? That I shit comes even to my Amazon? door. Like, I can't even Amazon. Oh my that god. That didn't even hit you. Did That's you just it. realize? I can't. Kroger pickups? Like, oh my god. Oh, groceries? That's your realm. That Kroger I mean, pickup life. Listen, I hate grocery shopping. And, oh my god, I saw this thing the other day. Off topic, but like, wine talk right now. She was saying that whenever you have kids or you get married, just make a pickup order and don't tell them. And then you have two free hours to go grocery shopping. And you don't have to go grocery shopping. You can go and do whatever you want. But everyone thinks you're grocery shopping. Is that the key to a happy marriage? That's a key to a happy life. Like, I would just tell my friends, yeah, I gotta go grocery shopping. Really, I just wanna leave. Like, just go sit. What do you do? You sit in your car? Yeah, you go get a milkshake somewhere, go through McDonald's. I don't know. What do you like? You wanna you go get a Starbucks? I mean, I, you get a what you Starbucks? want. Yeah, you go sit in your car and then you people watch. Is this the kind of stuff that the sister that doesn't edit the podcast gets time to do? So they get this third letter. It's up the stakes. It's saying that these little bombs are ready and it's not like the cool, like cute Mario ones. Like it's some real shit. So basically he's like, well, bitch, I didn't get what I wanted last time. So I'm going to make them bigger. Yeah. And and, and the detectives are like, well, bitch, um, I don't know if you know this, but it's not possible to get a thousand dollars out of an ATM, by the way. Right. So that's the other thing is this request can't even be fulfilled and they don't really have a way to communicate back. Yeah. To this Tesco bomber. Which starts them with putting ads in the paper in code, essentially, in order to contact 
Sally is what we're gonna call it. Yes, but can we talk about the fact that now we're we're British, there's newspapers, it's basically true crime and newsies, and I'm even more here for it. They put an ad in the paper uh, asking them to contact with a phone number, hoping that it'd be like some stupid, you know, not real threat and it would all be fine. And that was on September 6th. Right. So this guy's basically like, well, he hasn't done anything yet. So how serious is he? And he didn't really like reply to the number in the newspaper or I mean, he didn't reply at all. Mm -hmm. So he's like, well, maybe it's just a bluff. First of all, (laughs) they start the operation. The operation is called Operation Hornbill. I knew you were going to cover this, so Um, I didn't even try. I appreciate that. You know my territory. We are just bombarded with I have generic law scenes. Like, you could put (laughs) these scenes in any Law and Order SVU episode, and you'd be like, man, this is like, is this a season finale? Like, they're a big case right now. It's like they're flipping pages. This one woman's, like, turning around with her coffee, looking dramatic, and walking with her short bob haircut as it's, like, flowing through the wind. Like, so much is happening. And there's that one scene they use 1,500 <laughs> fucking times that's just the mailbox <laughs> through the trees. Yes! <laughs> like, 40 times. And you know that it's probably some random person. That is not an actor. And it's probably the back of their head, and they're like, I hope one day they see this documentary and they're just like, wait a minute, that That's is that the head. mailbox on 49th Street? <laughs> so before this, they describe a similar case that they thought might be attached. It might be the same guy resurrecting. That happened in 1990. Uh, it was a blackmailer named Rodney Wachello. And he tried to blackmail Heinz, like the ketchup company, which I was like, hold on. <laughs> I need to, and I did give it a goog. That really did happen. It was like this whole thing. And, guys, he spiked jars of baby food with glass shards and castric soda. Homeboy literally was like, you know who I'm going to go right after? Babies. Babies. Like, I mean, damn. Who? That's just, just. Uh, well, and what's worse. It made me crazy. What's worse? He was a police detective. I, I, that made me crazy. It literally made me want to throw up. They explained this story to show that there are people that are cops that go corrupt with this kind of thing and have done it before and so they thought that it might be it could be a person on the inside which is even scarier because it's such a local case that pretty much every police officer knows the intimate the intimate secrets of the case right or they're scared it's a fluke and i'm like well that's one to a zillion comforting right basically after this guy's explaining that maybe he's bluffing and it's not that serious i really appreciated the um, <laughs> reenactment video video editing of this it was beautifully done and honestly. then it was just like Boom. Yeah, no, it was lovely. Which I felt was like a low-key shade to the guy. Oh. Like, oh, you think it won't? Boom. Boom. I didn't think of that. <laughs> Which is how I felt like it happened in, in real time. Right? <laughs> what do you mean a bomb went off? I just said it was a fluke. Yeah, I think you, I think it just changed. I think, I think, yeah, I think it's not so much that fluke. Remember how you said it wasn't a big deal? I think. I think it's a big deal. Did you hear those sirens? I think maybe <laughs> it's now a big deal. Um, so yeah, this letter gets delivered to a woman's house. Her name was not disclosed, but they do say that she is okay, and she is rushed to the hospital and gets... She's okay, she just has minor injuries. So the bomb squad was called, and they say that it was easy to see that it was an incendiary composition, to which I I did a goog. It just is a type of homemade bomb, is what he's saying. It's like a type... Like, yeah, there's apparently different categories. I just kind of floated by as if I knew. I figured that you wouldn't, and so I knew that I had to take the responsibility of it. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Are we at this, like, what was in the bomb? Uh, yes. Okay, so this is kind of how he made the bomb. Um, and again, he had been inspired by... Rodney Wichello. Insi- incendiary composition? That, that's it, what I explained. It, it didn't contain it, it's just saying... It's essentially a fancy name for saying it was a homemade bomb. That's all he's saying. I thought, okay, and see, I was thinking in my mm-hmm. notes that that was, like, that black... Like, no, that's gunpowder. <laughs> okay, it's tarry stuff. That's like, gunpowder. And under that, though, like the stickier stuff. I, that's <clears throat> what I was confused about. No, I think that they were just reenacting stuff to be fancy. Okay, okay, fair. So that had been fastened to the inside of a CD cassette case, and that in turn had been inside of a jiffy bag of about an A5 or an A4 size. Which, what is, what is that measurement? Like a sandwich bag? Or like a... Do you measure sandwich bags in A5 and A4 sizes? Because I've never seen this system. No, but that was the one thing I googled. <clears throat> Leave it to me to only think <laughs> about the bag size. Yeah, but so like essentially I thought it was really interesting. That's terrible. I thought it was really interesting, honestly, the in-depth of how he constructed this thing. So I just want you guys to imagine a CD case filled with gunpowder and then a 
party popper string like attached to it with a safety pin so when you open the letter the party popper pulls the string and explodes the party popper which explodes all the gunpowder like the flames that's how this was formed that's crazy literally stuff that you could go and buy in a walmart right now cereal sisters does not support the making of homemade bombs <laughs> I would just like to add, I like how he, this bomb expert is going through and explaining so nicely, you know, all these things. And then he just cuts off with, not lethal size, but, you know, can cause a fire. Right. And right before that, he, like, looks at it and he's like, this guy knows bombs. <laughs> and that shit sent me. What a nice bomb there. Like, what? I like that bomb. That's, That's a, a nice bomb. bomb. All right. Um, then, okay, can we talk about the Royal Mail? Because oh, then, it ju they just say, they want the Royal Mail. And that felt bougie as what? fuck. <laughs> Why does everything sound so much fancier when you're British? I have never felt more like trailer trash than saying, I'm gonna go drop this in the mail bin outside, when I could be saying, I'm gonna go fancy myself to the Royal Mail. And that just seemed like such a better experience for your day. I would just like to start off by saying no British person has ever said, I'm going to fancy myself to the Royal Mail. Seriously. Remember that least. Nancy Drew dream? Okay, well, and I also, say things like that. The in that Royal dream. Mail, you, you wouldn't just go there. Like, <laughs> the Royal Mail means like the whole, it's like the United like Postal the Service. <laughs> it's like the UPS, that's a distributor. Like, the mail entirely <laughs> like okay, all of it in my mind it was definitely like the world's fanciest like ups bougie store or something like you walk through and like people are just like which package would you like like they're I, like bedazzled and Swarovski. they like curtsy at you that's what i picture <laughs> with your package <laughs> i'm sorry i'm a scurry away they get on the amazon truck <laughs> you can't come at me for saying fancy when you say i'm gonna scurry away <laughs> Look, that's redneck. What are you talking about? Scurry. Scurry. Oh. Oh, yeah. I guess scurry. No, <laughs> see, they don't see, say that. Fancy would be like, I've been whisked. Whisked away. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Back to the facts. Well, of the case. so because it wasn't a lethal bomb, they warned the male, but they weren't allowed to actually go through the male as if it were a. Right. A, a lethal one. They can't, like, get the warrant for it, so they just, like, warn the Royal Mail. Yeah. I just want to say that so a they, thousand times. Exactly. So they just look out for suspicious packages, and after only a few hours... A few hours. They receive a call from a nearby office. And they're trying to defuse these bombs by hand by cutting apart, like, the party popper string. Yes. But first off, they find out what's inside of them by using x-ray guns. How cool is that? It was pretty cool. Like a portable x-ray scanner. I was like, I want that. That's cool as shit. What? Just check it out. I realised that things become a lot more serious and that uh, the extortionists were saying to us, you know, I've told you I can do this, I've done it, now give me the money. He took himself way too he fucking did. seriously. It was really funny. As soon as the cameras were on him, did you see it in his eyes? He was like, lights, camera, yeah. action, this is oh, what Oh, yeah, happened. no, he ran a comb through his hair. I, he was ready. Yes, he, I needed he, him to take He did warm-ups in the bathroom. Someone definitely walked in and saw him, and he just walked away awkwardly and acted like he didn't do it, you know? Every time they cut, he's texting his mom, like, it's going really great, they're yeah. about to feed us lunch. Yeah, he's like, here's the air date, like, make sure you share it with your friends at Bingo, okay? <laughs> like, I just, I really need them to know. While they were working on these three letters that they had intercepted, seven more were sent out. They've already started to warn customers of strange packages, and the bomb squad is now on standby. They tell us the only time that they do that is when they have a political party is when they have a political party conference. Well, damn. I was um, about to say political party confetti, because that is what my Siri corrected me to. Well, and... you know, I think those would be a lot more joyful than conferences. So I, I am all for some it. Some patriotic red, white, and blue confetti. Please tell me. in England that's uh, not red, white, and blue. Yes, <laughs> it is. It is. Michael just looked at me like, no. <laughs> the slow, he had his phone out. He said, <laughs> he said, yes, it is. <laughs> Please tell me, please tell me you saw the sign outside of Tesco. It's like this giant standing sign. The big white like, one? That's like this giant picture of the packages and it's in like bright red letters and it's like, if you receive this package, and I was like, if I was about to walk into a store that said, if I receive a package with your like Tesco name on it, 
and it might blow up in my face, I would not be shopping at the store. <laughs> You're just really going to walk in and be like, back out. oh, fine. Like, no. So from there, they put two more ads in the Echo paper, still trying to make some type of contact. Yeah, they figured he was local, considering the letters coming through the mail. Yeah, can we just talk about that? I feel like they talked about that for way too long, basically, way too about long. how they set up the like <clears throat> perimeter of where they thought that he lived or whatever. They could have just said, like, he goes to all of these places. It's yeah. all in the same fucking town. Yeah. He's it, probably it, here. It was literally, like, what you would do for any investigation, you know? And he's taking it so seriously. You know he, like, wrote all these downs. He's like... Mm-hmm. You built a mental map and tend to create... Criminals are no different to everyday Joe Public. Your geography is inherent in you and what you do. You build up what we call a mental map. What happens with criminals, they tend to commit crime within areas they have familiarity with. My favorite part was when he's going through and they're showing shots because you know that he was like, did you get a, did you get a shot of him? Did you? I wanted to make sure it's clear. Was there a bird on it? Make sure there wasn't a bird on it. We want, it they have to be sparkling. You know, all these cameras in, like, the weirdest spots. Do you want to take like, another take? Like, one on top of a freaking, like, fast food place. <laughs> like, in the weirdest little spots. And can I just keep in mind, for that one video that they keep reusing of the guy through the bush at the mailbox, who the hell put that camera right there? <laughs> who said, you know what, it's through the bush is perfect. You're not going to be able to see him at all. This is great. And like, they use it so many times. So now the cops are requesting that maybe Tesco does put these cards out in case, like, we get to that level. They're talking about how in the mid-1990s, blackmailer Edgar Pierce had carried out a similar extortion campaign against Barclays Bank and supermarket giant Sainsbury, who also wanted, like, straight-up ATM cash. Mm-hmm. Like, it was it was basically the, the blueprints to the same case that they're trying to deal with now. Mm-hmm. The banker's like, well, I don't want to give out any money. But if it was to help the cops, then I guess we'd consider that. But he really didn't want to do it. Did I you literally, pick up on that? I was like, honestly, he worded it in a really funnily but well way of explaining. It was fragile. But it was, you could tell he was trying to get around of like, well, no, don't, don't get any ideas. Like, don't, don't tell us that because we're not going to give you money. But if the police came to us and said that we had to give it to you for it to work out and then they would give that money back to us because we helped the police, then it would be fine. Our policy is that we wouldn't pay any extortionist, but that we would certainly support a police operation, which meant going along and paying money in a controlled fashion. That's something that we would certainly consider. So then Sally sends a three-part code. And this code allowed cops to send a message so that they can explain why his initial request isn't going to work. In mid-October, he was tired of stalling, he said. Uh, He threatened to place a pipe bomb in a customer's garden that would kill people for quick seats. Tesco evaluated the police request. The bomber issued a new threat. Sally explained that uh, he was fed up with our stalling. Uh, He felt that uh, we needed to get on and meet his demands. And he described the new generation of device. This was to be a pipe bomb that he would place in a garden of a Tesco's customer and it would be capable of killing people. The police sent a three-part cipher code to communicate with him in the paper that they had come up with. Uh, they told, they told, did you notice they told the newspaper about it, finally? Mm-hmm. This shocked me. I have notes about this. Oh, yeah. Please go. Please. I want okay. to hear. Like, when they get the newspaper involved? Yeah. So, this guy is another, like, lights, camera, action, ready. He is so excited. Dressed to the nines. He's lit to be It's here. his moment, okay? So, he comes in, and he's just so fucking hyped to be a part oh, of yeah. this, right? Like, you know he was up all night. So, he sits down. And you, he just, with a sparkle in his eye, and I love him, let's be clear. Like, I'm roasting him, but I love him. He's like, he starts telling me that they're in communication with the police to Sally via Echo the newspaper. And he says, I was gobsnacked and absolutely fascinated, and I lost my fucking mind. I was gobsnacked. gobsnacked. Why do I not say that? That's starting effective now. That is a thing that I say. That's amazing. So then he starts working with the paper to get messages to Sally. And this guy, 
that's gobsmacked over all of it suddenly feels like he's a part of it, right? Did you pick up on that vibe? Oh, yeah. And all of a sudden, like, immediately he's, like, glistening his eye to super entitled. He's like, well, now it's my job to explain why we're giving free advertisement in the paper. I have to explain why we're pulling out this ad so that we can communicate with Sally. I'm the one that has to explain that to my boss. And I'm like, bruh, again, if the FBI comes to you, I'm pretty sure you can get it worked out. Mm -hmm. Like, your boss isn't going to be like, the FBI? Not today. <laughs> I like, but, Not today. But he's, like, so hype about his oh, yeah. responsibility and role in the case. I mean, honestly, he'd be me if, like, True Crime needed help. I'd be like, okay, I know this is tragic, but oh my god. Like... <laughs> <laughs> I've been listening my whole life for this. <laughs> right? So they finally get a letter in a mailbox that they have cameras on. Yeah. So. The same one we've seen 15 yeah, fucking thousand times. A thousand times of the terrible clip through the leaves that nobody can tell. It's like filmed on a calculator. It was. Like it's like blurred the whole way through. And what's so funny, they're like, we finally got this guy and it's this scene and they're bringing up the film out of the camera and it's so it's slow so and dramatic. Bad. And I'm like. Hold on, this was two thousand. This was filmed in two thousand ten. So it's quiet for a while, and then they hear from Sally, um, who says that they have until Saturday, the twelfth of December. Sally didn't respond, so they sent a new coded message asking for a money drop instead of the ATM cards. Mm -hmm. Sally sensed the trap and said no. He said he thought that they were never going to go through with it anyway. Essentially, he was just rubbing right. it in their face. He was like, "You're never going to do it. You're not gonna you do weren't it. going to anyway." And that's when the letter stopped. So that's. When I feel like they started getting really scared. Yeah, they feel like they're, like, on the last ditch, so they're going to have yeah. to publish these letters. Yeah. So, I'm going to let you do the official garden bomb explaining. Okay. But what I would like to touch on personally is how they reenacted this shit. <laughs> because they have all these scenes of them reenacting, 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 reenacting them rummaging through bushes and things. And I'm just picturing what set looks like that day. With all of these extra actors in these suits. I'm just picturing if I'm the actress hired that day, okay? And I'm, like, in this full gas mat suit such thing. They Has were, mat suit? I, you're right. It's not a gas mat. Gas mat I was thinking of, suit. like, a, not electronic. I'm saying really dumb things. Okay. So much is happening. Collect. So. Take a step back. I am saying Gather everything. Your shit is lost in the Grand Canyon right now, and you need a tow truck. I was thinking of, like, engineers, like mechanics. That's the type of suits that they look like okay, they're wearing. Okay, yes, jumpsuits. Thank you. But they're, mm -hmm. like, that type of synthetic material. You just, NCI suits. Thank you. Yes, okay. So, okay. <laughs> what I was saying, you're wearing that, and you're uh -huh. out in the middle of some bitch's lawn. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, all right, guys, so what you're going to do is you're going to, like, just... Act like you're, why don't you go examine some grass? <laughs> so I'm like rummaging through some bushes and shit. All for the cinematic effect of this reenactment. Oh yeah. He gave them a grid for the location of the bomb and where he had placed it. The problem with this grid is that uh, it had over, it covered over 550 houses. Mm -hmm. So you know, he didn't exactly give them like a, a narrow place to look. Right. So they needed a crap ton of people in all these uh, NCI jumpsuits to look around. So they just decide, finally, after, like, you know, the grid is going to be impossible to find him. We can't do the cards. What are we going to do? They do the cards. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> wait, but we have to go back. Oh, there. right. I did forget. I'm sorry. Because I had a heart attack. You did? Momentarily. I mean, yeah, no, momentarily. You, you're, they're searching, and they're, like, and it's, like, three days later. This is when they're in that bitch's garden. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're in her backyard. You know it. Looking they're, at the blades of grass. Oh, yeah, and they're, like, judging her, too. They're judging the angel statue that you know every old lady has and there's that one gnome that has just been rained on one too many times to where you know it comes Are you alive sure at you're night. not the one judging do we not all do this I... listen it's like when you go into someone's bathroom and you're like why do you have so many toothbrushes there, like there's two people that live here why is there four can you not throw your old one away and then you're looking at their medicine cabinet like, oh, what problems you do you have? You look at people's like, medicine cabinet. I mean, it's uh, not like first try, but like. <laughs> not first <laughs> visit, but that third time I come over, man, like, I'm seeing your shit. I mean, it depends on, like, what our relationship is. It's not like, like, it'll like, not dinner at your boss's house, nothing like that. But like, oh, we've been friends for a while? Like, I want to know what's wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs>
it was uh, effectively an inch by inch search through the gardens and through the bushes, uh, through the sheds and anything that existed within those gardens. Police and military personnel searching for an explosive device said to have been placed in the area. So far, nothing's been found. But as the search entered its second day, Detective Apprentice, like apprentices, just so I guess like the, the rookies, yeah, played a prank. But and it was like it was gas balloons, like over at the gas station, which I don't know what that is. But it the, sounds like that's what it is. That okay, well, it just it makes like a really loud popping sound, apparently, and it sounds like a bomb. And they just thought it was funny. Well, my anxiety was through the roof because they're just like doing that garden editing shit, and then you hear a bomb, and everyone like looks up, like what? And like it's all choreographed, and like everyone mm -hmm. on four. No, Jamie, I said four. And so they all look up at this bomb sound, and then it's like, just kidding, it was a prank. What? And what? you felt like that was relevant information for this docu- oh, That, right. I, whatever. That, I just had notes, and it just said this was pointless. After three days of looking, they finally get a letter from Sally saying that it was a hoax, that he hadn't planted a bomb. Well, no, it said that the pipe bomb was a hoax. Or, yeah, that the pipe bomb was a- a hoax. The other ones weren't. Right. And then they show us the shot, this fucking post box, like, mm -hmm. 15 times. It's the most generic British post box. Not like a blue one. I don't want you to think that. It literally looks like a tiny circular telephone box. Yeah, just through the trees from, like, the fifth floor. Yeah, it's just, like, this tiny red circular. I don't know if they all look like that, but it, it just, like, looks very distinguished. Zoomed in way too, too much to yes. like, be any type of a higher pixel than 450. But long story short, they trace it back to this mailbox. They ended up getting pictures of 38 people who placed letters in the mailbox the day that they got a letter from Sally. Yeah, and then we hear from, I think it's Perel, right after that he says, My view was certainly that a lot of those 38 would be regulars that live in the local area or pass that way regularly and use that post box. When and now it's been six months and between 20 and 25 letters. Detectives were also calling people in the area just to let them know and ask if they had gotten letters from this certain address that Sally was sending from, which is crazy, because mm -hmm. they couldn't intercept the mail. So they were just calling her house like, hey, by the way, be on the lookout for this address. One of the 38 posters was a local police officer that worked within Bournemouth. Just as the investigators had feared, it appeared that the bomber might be one of their own. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, they make it super dramatic. They pull him in. They start questioning him for hours. And he's, like, totally clear. It's yeah, no, they were just, like, like again. It. This documentary could have honestly been 15 minutes long. It could have, but I appreciate that they go into the, you know, if you were going through a case, like, how long? You gotta think that's, like, a, a day of work to go track down that guy. Right. Figure that out, bring him in, interrogate him. So, like, it's a whole day that you wasted on that case. So, it's a big part of information on why it took them six full months to do this case. They narrow it down to one person with the footage across the whole town because, basically, it's the same person that... That's gone to the the mailbox, the, the royal mailbox. Um, a gas station picked up, you know, X Y Z, and mm -hmm. they have footage of him basically all across town that they show us. They trace it back to 50 year old Robert Dyer, who is an unemployed electrician from Kingston area of Vermont. It's crazy the way that they find this. So he's carrying some kind of can. I just called it a gas can, but it, I don't think it is. I think it's it's whatever type of can that you carry gunpowder in. And that's how they tracked him down because he went to the gas station to fill up the can of gunpowder and then the gas station footage was much more clearer mm -hmm. than their CTC footage. So, or CCTV footage. And also at 39.15, there's a slow-mo shot of him in the gas station where he turns around and looks and oh his eyes God. are black. And let me tell you Oof. what, the, he is in my closet and under my bed <laughs> and in my shower and I will never not see that again and it was in my soul. So I will put a picture of it on our Instagram. His name is Robert Edward Dyer and we have police footage of him just walking out of his house, walking to his car, opening up the car door, or sorry, walking to his car, zipping up his pants and then getting in the car and i was like we're just not gonna mention that that he zipped is... his pants and he's just walking nonchalant just shoop, and then gets in and also i totally forgot this was a british documentary and he gets in on the right side and i was like wait no and i was like oh wait yes so now we're in his bungalow and jeff and paul are there with dyer to question him 
Jeff and Paul start to question Dyer in the living room, and a third officer goes into his bedroom, and they get on his computer and start the scanning process. There, they find a demand letter in the same format and signed Sally. Oof. Oof. That's your note? <laughs> Just Oof. <laughs> well, so before that, they ended up following him for a while. That's why we have the footage of him zipping his pants for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. And he does, like, a bunch of normal things, you know? They're like, he totally doesn't act weird. He doesn't act like he's being followed. You know, he doesn't act suspicious. Which I was like, would you not just be curious if you're someone that's a bomber and has been doing this, that this other officer is just gone? I don't think he, like, had a choice in it. Well, and that was the other thing that they said, too, that he was, like, emotionless and, like, wasn't really reacting to anything. He wasn't responsive. And I was like, right, because you're a sociopath. True. And it's just strange to me, I guess, if you're a sociopath, I don't know, maybe you wouldn't think about it, but he didn't ask for, like, you would need a warrant, technically, to do that. I don't know if they already did to have a warrant. They might already have warrants for the 38 people uh, in the mailboxes, which would make a lot of sense, but they didn't specify if they did or not. So they interview him for, they say, a few days, and police say... What I can't understand at the moment is you can't remember sitting at the computer drafting this letter. I don't understand it either, but but that is the case. What? And then the policeman's like, you might not understand why... Well, you did it, but I think you remember doing it. No. No, not me, boo-boo. Also, he... When they were interrogating him in his house, he was very, you know, non-emotional. But also when he was being arrested... He didn't give a fuck. He did not care at all. Did not give a fuck. Okay. Yeah. Like... So they start taking apart his house, and uh, they go into his boiler, and there's a piece of paper with the coded notes. Mm -hmm. That in his handwriting of him trying to decode the messages in the newspaper. And then they finally get their last bit of footage, which was taken less than 24 hours before his arrest of his mailing of the last letter. His dog was called Sally. That's why. That drove. Leave the dogs out of this. Yes. Leave the fucking dog out of it. Like, you that's had to bring the weird. dog into this? And he just admits that he thought money was going to be his problem solver. That's the only reason that he did it. They also tell us that he had a shed that Oof. he used to make them, and I hate creepy sheds. You yeah, know no, how sheds I hate are creepy just the sheds. worst. Why? If you're going to be a serial killer, why can't you work out of like a cotton candy store? Right. Why does it always have to be a shed in the middle of and- fucking nowhere? So, on May 4th, in which I have May the 4th be with you, Dyer pleaded guilty to nine counts of blackmail and one of common assault for the letter bomb. He was sentenced to 16 years and appealed to 12. They ran seven pages in the newspaper of the story of the case, and he is, like, ecstatic. So excited about this. Like, you know that he wrote it himself, and he was just like, I was the one that had to help on the case. I had to hide it all from the rest of the people that worked here. No one could know. It was all up to me. It was all me. I'm the one that got the ads out. I'm the one that got the papers out. I'm the reason they found the killer. Like, you know that he hyped it up. He tells that story every year at Thanksgiving. Did you see the the thing? It was like, he can sleep easy again. And I was like, well, I'm glad someone can. Uh, um, Also, he had no connection to Tesco at all. He simply thought that they were a large company and they would have money. So he didn't think this out at all. He was like, yeah, sure, that one. That one? That sounds good. Yeah. It was like he was just strolling by. I was like, you know what I should do on Friday? I I also just have, the detectives just threatens us to never try this. He's like. He does. He's like, this is not accomplishable. If you do this, you will be caught. Do not do this. We will find you. And I was like, uh. And he was released in 2007. He's out now. In which I have news that Devin does not know about. Oh, wait. Yeah, because the, the documentary kind of ends with this uh-huh. on-screen text that just says, Robert Dyer was released from prison in 2007, and he's still alive in southern England. So Robert has a Twitter. What? Robert tweets? Can we call him Dyer? So can we call him Dyer? We can call him Dyer. Okay. So Dyer has not tweeted since 2018. What would you? And, but this documentary came out in 2010. Oh. And it's, it's, Devin, it's depressing. Like, it's scary, the level of mental health we're dealing with here. Well, read us some tweets. Last tweet, in need of coffee, exclamation point. Oh, that's Tweet before that, the pill that everyone wants, and it's truth. The fuck? Excuse me? Did they get weirder? Brain, why can't you just shut down another sleepless night? 
Oh. Having anxiety and depression is like being scared and tired. At the same time, it's the fear of failure, but no urge to be productive. It's wanting friends, but hating society. Oh. Yeah, it goes on and on. There's He works on facial sculptures of creatures. Oh. Um, and he retweets Xbox. I thought I had answers to my questions, and now I have a whole new realm of questions. But you know what? At least he's busy making tweets and not... Royal bombs. I mean, yeah. So he only started tweeting in 2017. There's literally only, like, a total of 20 tweets. Well, were they getting a good response? No. In total, I don't, I don't even see... He has 47 followers. Wild. Yeah. His first ever tweet was, Would you have suffered from depression? It's easier to hide it all behind a mask and smile at the world, even if you're being torn up inside. I mean, obviously, we have some mental health issues going oh, on. Oh, yeah, the for fact sure. That on a Friday night, the best activity was to try to embezzle money via harassing innocent people via mail bombs. Yeah, and literally, it looks like he tweeted a bunch for, like, a week. Literally, he, like, tweeted a bunch and then left for a year and then comes back and tweeted a bunch for, like, a week and then left. He got dumped. Yeah, like, what the heck? Damn. And that's all we know about him. Tell the people, IER our friends, where they can find you. <laughs> IER our friends? IER our friends. Um, you all already follow us. But I'm at Audie Dennis, or uh, Audie underscore Dennis on Instagram and Awkward Audio on TikTok. And I am at Devin Dennis XOXO on pretty much everything. And you can find our page on Instagram, Serial Sisters with three A's. Serial Sister! Yeah. We'll be back next week with another episode. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to put these out every week. This is our second one. And if you have any next ideas Next week's going to be juicy. Do you I'm already ready. have it? Oh. oh, you're not ready. And I'm keeping it. You're just not. I'm just telling you it's a good ass case. Oh. Well, okay. I'm surprising you. Well, I'm not going to play the trailer for next week then if I don't know what it is. Nope. All right, guys. You'll be surprised with me. We'll see you next week. All right. Okay, bye. Okay, don't say bye. God. My bad. <laughs> bye. <coughs> I was laughing too. It was and like it a laugh cough. Yeah. That was really funny though, so please say it again with that much enthusiasm. I'm pissed.